Hi, I'm Bruce Baker and this is another lecture in my series on the history of New Orleans. Today's topic is the postbellum cotton trade in New Orleans. And I have to be honest, of all the things that I'm going to talk about, this is probably my single favorite one. It's the area that I've been doing the most of my own original research in over the past few years. And in some ways I could probably talk about this for hours, but we're going to try to uh, keep things under control a bit and not talk for hours, but just try to give you a, a, a good overview of the major points here and the things that I think are particularly significant. So we're going to start with sort of the main idea, which is that the disruption the Civil War caused to the international cotton trade, along with changes in transportation infrastructure and marketing methods meant that New Orleans lost its antebellum dominance of the cotton trade. But by the beginning of the 20th century, the New Orleans Cotton Exchange had become the venue for setting the world price of cotton. And that's going to be what I'm going to try to unfold in the next little while here. So, unsurprisingly, the Civil War disrupted all sorts of things, and it really disrupted the international cotton trade. If you want the, the really big picture about this, the book that you want to look at uh, covering not just the, the Civil War, but sort of the cotton trade and, and the rise of cotton over several centuries is uh, Sven Beckert's book, Empire of Cotton, uh, or also Giorgio Riello's book on cotton. But uh, Beckert also has an article that looks specifically at uh, the disruption caused during the Civil War. But basically, as we looked at with the, the brief lecture here on the Civil War, and New Orleans being a port and exporting all sorts of things, but exporting lots and lots of the South's cotton crop, the Union obviously puts up a blockade of the South. And what this means is not that it's a watertight blockade and nothing gets in and nothing gets out, but it does mean that the, the freighters that are carrying cotton and these sort of large uh, ships are unable to, to make it. And so there is a, bits of cotton coming out, but not really significant amounts. So at this time, at the time that the, the war breaks out, most of the cotton coming out of the U.S goes to Liverpool, and that's to feed the mills of Lancashire and Manchester and that area. There is some going to other European markets. There's some going to the expanding cotton manufacturing sector, sector in the north of the United States in New England. But at the time of the war, most U.S. cotton goes to Liverpool, and most cotton coming into Liverpool comes from the U.S. South. So when this disruption of the Civil War happens, we get the Lancashire cotton famine, which is basically that the mills in Lancashire have no cotton uh, to, to spin and are unable to continue. One of the things that happens out of this is attempts to sort of develop alternative sources of supply. And remember, of course, the British Empire at this point has vast tracts of land in various parts of the globe that they control and they start sort of looking around for other places where they can get cotton. India is an obvious source since India had been uh, until industrialization happens in, in Britain. India had been the major source of the growing and manufacturing of cotton. So the British turn to India to try to replace that. There's some success, uh, but the quality of the raw cotton coming out of India which has a lot to do with uh, how it's handled and sort of the infrastructure for gathering and marketing and exporting it from India, the quality of it is inferior. So the advantage that India gets is temporary and eventually is uh, overtaken by the U.S. again. One of the other major effects of the Civil War is the disruption of the factorage system. So prior to the Civil War, Cotton factors had personal relationships with the planters that they represented who were selling the cotton and also the representatives of the manufacturers buying the cotton. So one of the things that we think about, uh, a number of people have pointed this out, is that New Orleans is very much a sort of middleman city. The whole of the New Orleans 
economy essentially is based on this position of being a middleman between people buying things and selling things and cotton factors are probably the best example of this so they would arrange to sell the cotton that a particular plantation owner produced they would also arrange uh, with the people who were going to buy it where they could get the cotton from so it's a, a kind of almost a one-to-one -one relationship between people who need particular kinds of cotton and people who are growing particular kinds and qualities of cotton. Cotton factors also provide a range of other services. They arrange finance, they uh, arrange buying and delivering of supplies for plantation owners. So they're sort of a, a one-stop shop. And they take a small commission on each transaction that they do, and that's sort of how their system works. However, these long-standing relationships that they have with their uh, plantation owners and, and cotton buyers are completely disrupted by the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War disrupts the supply of cotton. It disrupts the, the basis of finance, which is to say the enslaved people who were set up as collateral in case somebody didn't pay their debts and so forth. And so that has a significant and long-lasting effect on New Orleans. Now, the probably still the best piece of scholarship on this is a couple of articles by Harold Woodman, which are sort of developed and rolled into his book, King Cotton and His Retainers. And if you want to know in great detail about that, you can look there. Uh, one of the things that we see very much in New Orleans is that the Civil War has quite a direct effect, effect on the amount of the U.S. cotton crop that's physically traveling through the port of New Orleans. So if we look at before the Civil War, sort of the last full crop that's not disrupted in the growing or, or marketing of it by the Civil War, the crop of 1859-60, and remember our cotton years really go from September the 1st uh, to September the 1st. So the total production of cotton in America that year was 4,875,870 bales, and 44% of that went through the port of New Orleans that year. So we can see that New Orleans is at this point really the dominant marketing point for the dominant export of the United States. It's a tremendously powerful position to be in. Now, just eight years later, when we look at 1867 to 1868, because of the disruption and destruction and so forth of, of the Civil War and the topsy-turviness of, of labor and, and how cotton was actually going to be produced, the total production in the U.S. is down by just about half, down to 2,430,893 bales according to the, the statistics that we have. Now of that, the proportion that New Orleans exports has also dropped by very nearly 50%. So the proportion of that much reduced 50% crop that New Orleans is exporting has dropped from 44% the year before the war to 24%. And this proportion does sort of rise over the next few years, but it certainly never rises back uh, to the proportion that we saw during the, the years before the war. And part of this is because of changes in the infrastructure of transportation. So as we've seen in a number of ways, the importance of the river to the economy of New Orleans was already in decline in a number of different ways, particularly as we're seeing the development of railroad infrastructure uh, across the north and in the Great Lakes area and sort of the rise of Chicago as a big sort of uh, entrepot and a transportation hub from the east to the west. We see the decline in the amount of grain and other products from the upper Mississippi Valley that are coming through New Orleans. That's apparent before the Civil War happens. What we start seeing very quickly uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War is that the cotton that used to mostly come down the river is not necessarily coming down the river and through New Orleans anymore. The railroad network is expanding and obviously uh, during the war, there are sort of, people get out of the habit and, and the sort of relationships with factors and so forth that made it make sense to send things down the river to New Orleans shift. And we start to see a sharp increase 
uh, immediately after the Civil War in the amount of cotton that is sent overland by rail to either mills in New England and the quantity and, and proportion of cotton that the mills of New England are taking up and using is increasing, or being shipped to particularly New York but other East Coast ports for export. So we see less cotton coming floating down the river to New Orleans and more cotton going in railroad cars across to the Atlantic. This is tied into, I would argue, as I've, um, as I've said in this article about sandbars and so forth in the August 2020 issue of the Journal of Southern History, this is also tied to shipping issues which have to do with how easy or difficult it is to get ships in and out of the harbor of New Orleans. But there are all sorts of things. So it's partly the, the sort of just general laziness and haplessness of the business community that scholars like Scott Marler and Michael Ross have pointed out. But there are also these sort of technical logistical things about shipping and about the, the harbor and, and so forth. Anyway, it's a bit of a mess. There are also some significant changes that are happening at this point in marketing methods in general. And the key thing here is the rise of cotton exchanges. Now, I want to say a little bit about how a cotton exchange is different than the previous system of cotton factors. So remember the factors had personal relationships with sellers and buyers and they provided a range of services. And the, the key difference here between a cotton factor and a cotton broker is the cotton broker focuses just on the cotton, doesn't worry about all these other things about, you know, buying any equipment or making sure that this plantation owner can get, you know, some cloth for silk cloth for his wife's dress for a party and all these little fiddly things that factors did as sort of, you know, sort of uh, not only sellers, but sort of personal buyers for plantation owners and so forth. Cotton broker is just interested in buying and selling the cotton and also is not necessarily interested in forming these sorts of enduring relationships with individuals. The other thing that's important to remember here is that a lot of cotton brokers didn't buy directly from farmers nor sell directly to manufacturers. They were just middlemen. Now it's complicated because some of them are buying and selling on behalf of other people while at the same time buying and selling on their own behalf. So there's a lot of sort of mixing and matching and uh, you know certainly they kept their accounts straight but us as historians looking back at it can find it a bit confusing. But the bulk of their business is not buying and selling cotton on their own behalf, but buying and selling cotton for their clients. So we get this growing class of cotton brokers who need to uh, be able to communicate with each other to do these deals. And so cotton exchanges are created as a venue for brokers to meet. So it needs a physical infrastructure, a place for brokers to meet. But the Cotton Exchange also provides a set of rules for its members to do business through. So what this does is it creates a sort of predictable, rule-bound institution so that if you want to sell cotton, you can get hold of somebody at the Cotton Exchange and say, ah, this broker is a member of the New Orleans Cotton Exchange. And therefore, I can trust in the, the rules and um, procedures and trustworthiness and so forth of the exchange. And if this person is a member, basically the exchange vouches for them. So what we see is, is that sort of institutional reputation and institutional um, stability and so forth taking the place of the individual cotton broker, or sorry, cotton factor from before the war. So we see a shift really from sort of the individual to the institution in this way. There's a much broader and longer history of exchanges uh, covering a lot of different things. We've probably heard of the Chicago Board of Trade or uh, even the, the London Royal Exchange and so forth, but I'm just going to focus on cotton here. Cotton exchanges really sort of go back to the Liverpool Cotton Brokers Association, which is established in 1841. It's a slightly different sort of situation there because clearly people are not selling a lot of cotton 
uh, being grown nearby in Liverpool. That's really sort of just something that develops in order to buy in cotton for the manufacturing centers in Manchester and, and Lancashire. The New York Cotton Exchange is established in 1870 and it's very sort of tied in with the, the sort of growing finance sector of Wall Street, which as a number of historians, actually Sven Beckert's um, earlier book, Moneyed Metropolis, makes really clear this is a sort of structural change in the US economy and the sort of rise of the importance of New York nationally and, and globally as a center of finance in this period. So the New York Cotton Exchange, we can sort of see as um, sort of one part of that development of business in, in finance in New York City. But a number of others follow about 10 years later, and we can sort of see this rise of other cotton exchanges um, in, in the, the years, sort of, well, not 10 years, but sort of immediately after and, and sort of all set in place. And we can see this as sort of happening as the, the dust settles on the Civil War and the disruption of that and the very beginnings of uh, a sort of bit of economic recovery. So the New Orleans Cotton Exchange, which is in the picture here, is established in 1871. And by the middle of the 1870s, there are cotton exchanges in a number of other uh, ports of the South, Mobile, Norfolk, Charleston, Savannah, Galveston, but also a few inland points where cotton is concentrated and, and exported from. So Augusta, Memphis, St. Louis, I'll sort of include Houston as inland because it's, it's kind of coastal, kind of inland. But certainly by the middle of the 1870s, there are a number of these cotton exchanges and we see the, the real decline of the cotton factors as a way of uh, marketing the cotton crop of the South. Now, one of the key things here in terms of how these cotton exchanges work is futures trading. And for with a sort of bit of shameless self-publicity self here, I'll suggest that if you want to really understand the history of futures trading in cotton, uh, look for a book that I wrote along with Barbara Hahn a few years ago called The Cotton Kings. And that goes into great detail. So I won't talk about all of that here, but essentially futures trading is a way of buying and selling something, trading something that's not physically present. So you're making a commitment to buy or sell something, in this case cotton, in the future at a particular point for a particular price. Now, this has all sorts of benefits for producers and manufacturers, the main one being that it reduces price volatility. But that's only if the system is working properly. What we find as the 19th century wears on is that while these institutions are sort of built on trust and reliability and, you know, you go to the New Orleans Cotton Exchange because you know they have rules and whoever is a member there is following those rules and is going to be solvent and, and so forth, it is possible for clever, motivated people to manipulate the rules of the cotton exchanges. And when this happens, we, we don't see the sort of benefit of price volatility being reduced. What we see is price volatility being sort of deliberately manipulated for the benefit of the people trading on the exchange, but to the extreme detriment of the people buying the cotton and also the, the farmers selling it. So we see, we see manufacturers saying, actually, we don't really like these artificially low prices because they go up and down. We would rather pay a higher price and have it be steady and predictable. And of course, the farmers are not very thrilled about getting low prices as a result of this. One of the other things that we see in this period is the sort of steady decline of Liverpool and a little bit later of New York and the rise of New Orleans as the place that essentially sets the global price of cotton. Now, Liverpool's strength in the global market was from monopsony. That is to say, they were the major buyer of cotton in the world for much of the 19th century. However, as production in the US and eventually, um, and here I mean textile production, cotton manufacturing in the US and elsewhere, including places like Russia, France, Switzerland, eventually Japan, 
As that increases through the 19th century, well, the proportion of cotton manufacturing that's based in Manchester, Lancashire, the hinterland of, of Liverpool, is shrinking. So there's a sort of slow, steady decline of Liverpool's commercial power to really sort of set the price that all the other markets find themselves having to follow. The New York Cotton Exchange begins to sort of grow in power, and that has something to do with, as I was saying, the uh, changes in transportation infrastructure that we see after the Civil War that start bringing um, cotton to New York, although that sort of goes into decline eventually. But it also has to do with the connections to sort of finance in New York and also the increasing uh, proportion of cotton that's going to mills in New England. But for a futures work it to really work properly, someplace like the New York Cotton Exchange, and it's also worth noting here that there are essentially three cotton exchanges that sell futures, so that trade futures contracts, Liverpool, New York, and New Orleans. But in order for a futures market to work properly, there has to be a supply of physical cotton coming through that market to make sure that the futures prices stay where they should be. I won't really go into exactly why that is and, and how that works, but that is quite essential. One of the things that we see <coughs> is that by the 1890s, there's a very minuscule amount of physical cotton coming through New York. And if you want the detail on that, you can have a look at uh, figure 3.2 on page 41 of my book, The Cotton Kings. So as the proportion of physical cotton coming through New York begins to dry up by the 1890s, what we see is the New York Cotton Exchange maintains its dominance of the cotton futures market by man manipulating the market through ever more elaborate processes of disinformation and ever more corrupt, I think is a fair enough word, corrupt mechanisms for the transactions on the exchange. The upside, upshot of this is that it unnaturally depresses the price of cotton and puts it below the cost of production by the middle of the 1890s. So there's a real crisis in cotton production by the 1890s. We're very familiar with this when we think about the history of the South, and it's usually been chalked up to a very simplistic understanding of the South is producing too much cotton and therefore the price goes down, simple supply and demand curve. Well. I have argued, and I, I think I'm right, we can disagree I suppose, but I think that there's a lot more to it, and I think part of the reason is that the cotton futures market is so messed up and so deranged by these practices and so forth. And what we see in response to that is sort of the rise of New Orleans. So a group of New Orleans cotton brokers led by William P. Brown, the fellow in the foreground of this sketch here, are interested in setting the price of cotton higher at a price that they think more accurately represents the balance between supply and demand. And of course, you know, they're taking a, a cut on everything so that, you know, if cotton is selling for 10 cents a pound, they're going to make a good bit more money than they will if it's selling for 6 cents a pound. So what they do is they begin to get organized and sort of gather their resources around the year 1900 and sort of wait for an opportunity. And in the summer of 1903, they managed to corner the world market for cotton and drive the price from 7 cents to 14 cents a pound. Now the price doesn't stay at 14 cents, it drops back down, but it never really goes below 10 cents a pound again in the next several years. Uh, a number of other things happen uh, detailed in the Cotton Kings, and this eventually leads to the federal regulation of the cotton futures market in 1914. I think this is significant beyond cotton because it's really the first time that the federal government regulates a financial derivative if we set aside the very brief and, and quite disastrous attempt to regulate gold futures during the Civil War. And I'll leave the story at 1914 since the outbreak of World War I completely disrupts 
the world cotton market again very much as the Civil War had, and things begin to change in different ways after the end of World War I. But we'll sort of bring our story of the cotton trade in the postbellum period to a close there with a focus on New Orleans. And I would say that if you want to see more, there's a bit of a bibliography here of things that you can have a look at.